Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. My name's Chelsea and I am going to be starting, I'm going to be starting a series. Um, if anybody knows me on here, they know that I am obsessed with true crime. I watch it all the time. Um, I don't really watch TV, but when I do, I'm either watching, you know, a TV show that has to do with police or firefighters or um, criminals in general or um, I'm always watching YouTube and a couple favorites of mine are Bailey Sarian. If you don't know who she is, check her out because she is bomb. Um, she is definitely so funny. I love her. I love her personality. She just, I don't know. I'm just drawn to her and she just, I could be her friend. So hi Bailey. <laughs> um, another one of my favorites and she's actually been one of my favorites for a long time. Her name is Kendall Ray. I'll link both of them down in the description, but, um, yeah, check her out because she does a lot of good cases. I just love her as a person and she's an animal lover like me. So I think we bond with that as well. Um, but yeah, definitely check them out. They are so interesting to watch. Uh, if you are interested in true crime, that's I'm hoping why you're on this video. But if not, check them out anyway. You never know. But yeah, without further ado, I am going to get into this video and be prepared because I'm starting off with no makeup, so just hang in there. So today I'm going to be talking to you about a case that I've been researching a little bit, um, and I'm just going to get started, and I'm going to do my makeup at the same time because it's Saturday night, and I just want a little makeup on so not that I'm doing anything I'm just like literally hanging around my house but I don't care whatever I have no makeup on my face right now so I look a little scary but that's going to change okay that is going to change right now so this case is about a girl named Carla Jan Walker and I'm gonna insert some pictures of her in as we go. So this is Carla Jan Walker. She was born on January 31st in 1957 in Tarrant County, Texas. She was the daughter of Leighton Neal Walker and Doris Charlene Lindley Walker. She was a sister to Charles, Steve, James, Cynthia, Diane, and Charlene. So this case is going back to 1974. Carla was 17 at the time, and that is when she attended Western Hills High School in Benbrook as a junior. She was described as being very outgoing. She was really popular and just super friendly. She got along with everybody. It was super easy for her to make new friends. She was very athletic. Her friends had said that they didn't really know anybody that didn't like her because she was just so, like she was a people person. She was just an extremely outgoing, bubbly person full of life. She never really got into any trouble. She never really had any serious relationships other than her boyfriend at the time, Rodney McCoy. And Rodney was 18 years old at the time. He was a senior at the same high school as Carla. The two had been dating for about a year and were pretty much the ideal couple. She was a cheerleader and he was the quarterback at the high school they attended. Um, Rodney was absolutely crazy in love with Carla. He was described as being a super sweet guy. He was quiet, but incredibly good to Carla. Carla's older sister, Sydney, said the two had a great relationship and never fought. Carla's family welcomed him with open arms. He went on family vacations with them all the time. I mean, overall, a really good guy. Carla was actually going to be following Rodney um, after she graduated. They wanted to go to Texas Tech together 
to continue their relationship, you know, see what the future had in store for them. So they lived in a town where everybody pretty much knew everybody. And on Friday nights, um, all the local teenagers would basically meet up at Benbrook Lake. Um, To have a like beer bust which I think is just like a big party on the lake I don't really know I've never heard of a beer bust before probably should have looked it up but it honestly sounds to me like a party on the lake with like kegs of beer <laughs> and a bunch of teenagers just hanging out having fun on a Friday night so I think that's what it is. But that is where Carla and Rodney attended on February 15th, 1974. So there was said to be different age groups here at these beer busts. And I guess one of the... Oh, God, that is so harsh. Eh. Oh, well. So I guess there was a guy that was, like, flirting with Carla and making it very uncomfortable for her and Rodney. Kind of, you know, killing the vibe, throwing them off their their element, like, just making them un uncomfortable. I mean, hello, you see that she has a boyfriend literally right in front of you, and you're flirting with his girlfriend. Like, how disrespectful. But anyway, this just made... um Carla and Rodney really uncomfortable for obvious reasons and they just decided to leave and go to a burger place that mostly everybody that you know um went to the beer bust was going after probably like you know their hangout place after the party ended so while they were hanging out at this burger place the guy that was actually flirting with Carla at the beer bust, he actually ended up showing up there. And Carla and Rodney were basically just annoyed, so they just decided to go home for the night um, because they were going to be seeing each other the next day for the Valentine's dance at their school. So it's the next day, and Carla is super excited for this dance. Um, you know, she's just ready to have some fun with her boyfriend and her friends and dance it up on the dance floor. She even borrowed a dress from her older sister, Sydney. So while they were at the dance, they were having a lot of fun. Um, there was said to be alcohol and involved, but I don't know if they did that at the dance or beforehand or but they were just being you know teenagers at a school dance and hold on I'm gonna do my eyebrows so yeah I forgot where I left off but basically they were just having a good time at the dance but Rodney and Carla actually left the dance a little bit early to kind of just hang out before they had to go home um and this is when they decided to go to a local uh, bowling alley where teenagers around the area would kind of just go there to, you know, kill time, hang out, relax. But when they got there, they had to use the bathroom. So they ended up going inside the bowling alley to use the bathroom. And when they came back, they were just hanging out in the parking lot. Um, in Rodney's mother's car. So Rodney was in the driver's seat and Carla was in the passenger seat and Carla's back was to the door so she was kind of leaning up against the door and they were just you know talking, kissing, doing their thing when all of a sudden Carla's door was ripped open and a man was dragging her out. And Rodney tried everything that he could to hold on to her as tight as he could, but he was actually struck in the head. Rodney said that Carla was screaming, quit hitting him, and he, 
he actually thought that he was paralyzed and that the man had shot him because the man kept putting a gun to his face and like all he could hear was like the clicking of the gun. So Carlo was on her feet and he said that she was screaming, go get my dad, go get help. I'll go with you, don't hurt him. And then Rodney just lost all consciousness. He blacked out, but when he came to, he had realized, you know, what just happened, and he immediately rushes to Carla's house and is frantically banging on her door. And when Carla's family, you know, heard this banging on the door, they automatically knew something was wrong, as everybody would, would I'm sure. That's like the worst. So when they open the door, he's actually telling them, you know, they've got her, they've got her. And Carlos' family is just looking at him because he is just covered in blood. And they have no idea, you know, what just happened. They immediately call an ambulance for Rodney because he is just covered in blood. And they call the police and the police go to the bowling alley to try to see if, you know, they can find anything or like talk to any witnesses or anything. And the FBI is actually called in because this was one of the biggest searches at this point um, for the Fort Worth police. And Carla's family had no idea like who would want to do this to their daughter you know, there was no motive. She didn't have any enemies. So they ended up questioning everybody at the dance as they should because that's where Carla was that night. But nobody caught interest to them and everybody was pretty much ruled out as a suspect. Um, meanwhile, Rodney described the man as being pretty stocky, not really tall, maybe like 5'10", a white male but doesn't really remember much else other than that because he was knocked out. But he does remember hearing something fall, maybe like a hat or Carlos purse or something. But like I said, he was knocked out. He doesn't really remember, um, which is unexplainable. Or unexplainable, which is understandable. <laughs> As they searched for Carla, the Walker family basically went through hell. And Carla's older sister, Sydney, said that she remembers that her and her family would just, you know, sit there and pray for hours and hours that Carla would just show up. You know, somebody would just come by and push her out of the car and drive off and obviously you know Carla would be scarred for life but she would be okay because she was alive but sadly that was not the case for Carla her body was found in a concrete mine culvert not far from Benbrook Lake her clothes had been ripped her underwear was off her body her promise ring from Rodney was about 12 feet from her body they identified three pubic hairs on her that were not hers, one on her body and two in her vaginal canal, but not much else was discovered. The police had no leads or witnesses, which is absolutely crazy to me because, especially on a Saturday night at a local bowling alley, I mean, I'm sure the bowling alley is, you know, packed with people, I would assume, so for for this you know crime to happen and nobody is there to witness it i mean it's just so crazy to me it's just I don't, it's crazy it's mind-blowing to me based on what the examiners looked at they believe manual strangulation was the cause of death carla had fractures that were present she had abrasions bruises her eyes were clouded over a little bit there was barbed wire left at the scene that could possibly match the marks that were found on her thighs maybe from either lifting or dragging her body 
Examiners also found morphine in her system, which was not a common drug of choice in those days. And she still had Taco Bell undigested that she had ate the night of the dance. Police believe that she had been beaten, raped, tortured alive for two days after her disappearance and then strangled. Carla's sister, Sydney, had said that Carla definitely would have fought back. Um, she was really little, but she was definitely t a tough girl. And she actually described her as being a little spitfire. When Carla's funeral was held, so many people were there. I mean, this crime really impacted the whole community for a long time. There were people standing outside the church just to be there for her. Which, police were really watching everybody at the funeral. Um, everybody was a suspect at this point because they were really stuck on this one. I mean, this girl was really a good person. You know, she, everybody loved her. Like, she had no enemies. Um, they had no leads. They had no idea who would do this to this, you know, young beautiful girl. So this is when they start to, you know, interrogate Rodney because he was the last one to see Carla, you know, before she was taken and killed. They start to follow him around and, you know, kind of see where he's going throughout his day, what he's up to, um, how he's behaving and all that. But it didn't take long for them, you know, to realize he was telling the truth. Where is my eyeliner? Aha! Aha! So, yeah, I think he also uh, took a polygraph test. And I don't know if I will, I mean... I don't know how accurate they are. I know that some people say they're not really that accurate. Um, but that was enough for police to start looking elsewhere, you know, trying to figure out who really did this because it wasn't Rodney at this point. So then they finally have a suspect. And this is Tommy Ray Neeland. Two months after Carla's murder, Tommy attempted to abduct and sexually assault a teenager near the Arlington, Texas area. The girl managed to luckily escape unharmed after Neeland lost control of the wheel and crashed his 1957 pickup into the ditch. When police arrived at the scene of the accident, obviously Neeland was gone already but when they identified who the truck belonged to the police thought no way that this young 25 year old youth minister was responsible for this but sure enough the girl later identified neeland as the man who tried to abduct her when police interrogated neeland they quickly ruled him out as a suspect in carla's case because he was an open book. He easily confessed to all the crimes that he had done and he was not budging on Carla. He was not confessing to that whatsoever. So police believed him because why would he confess to all of these other crimes and not confess to Carla's? It makes no sense. If he did it, he would say it if he was already confessing. And he actually confessed to three murders that all took place in the Fort Worth area. He was sentenced to 10 years for the attempted kidnapping of Danita Cash. Two life prison terms for the murders of Jane Handy and Robert Golson. And 270 years for the kidnapping, murder, and abuse of a corpse of Nancy Mitchell. Like, how sick is this 25-year-old youth minister, guys? He's a youth minister. Like, gross. Now, unfortunately, he only served 13 years due to overcrowding. 
which doesn't make any sense to me because he's a murderer. What? Like, pick somebody that is in there for theft or something. Like, why are you going to release a murderer? That just doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. Thankfully, the truck crashed and Danita was able to run away unharmed. I mean, Jesus. Thank God for that. But anyways, yeah, he was released in September of 1987. But that didn't last long because he ended up violating his probation seven years later in, in July 1994 when police pulled him over for his vehicle registration tabs being expired. This is like pink. Side note, do you guys have that problem? Like clearly this is red, right? This is red, clearly. And it's showing up pink. Okay, I just put on red lipstick, but I actually don't like it. So I'm gonna take it off. <laughs> So yeah, when police pulled him over, they noticed <clears throat> that he had two rifles under the seat of his truck. And he ended up being put back behind bars where he should be. Police never connected him to Carlo's case, but at the time, they were trying to figure out if Carla's case was connected to another case with Becky Martin. Becky was a wife and a mother who was abducted after attending a class she had at Tarrant County Junior College on February 7th, 1973. Almost exactly one year before Carla's abduction. They were remarkably similar in looks, both very petite and beautiful girls. And Becky's remains were found over a month later after she went missing in a culvert not far from Benbrook Lake, just like Carla. Police were unable to connect their cases though because they just didn't have enough to go off other than they were very similar. And Becky's case is still unsolved to this day after 47 years. And that is just so sad to me. I mean... Imagine like her family not knowing what happened to their mother, not knowing, you know, who did it and who was responsible for it and just never getting that closure that they desperately probably needed. So later in the 70s, a man named Jimmy Dean Sasser actually confessed to Carla's murder he told the police that he was the man responsible. He was the one that they've been looking for, but the charges were later dropped after he, you know, recanted everything that he said, claiming that he just made it all up, which I'm like, okay. Yeah, I just got out of the clear blue sky, just, you know, made the story up. I don't really know. Like, don't y'all have anything better to do than confess to crimes that you didn't commit? I just think it's a little weird, but okay. Now, the public didn't know this at the time, but a letter was sent to the police that read, blank, killed Carla Walker in Benbrook. Sign, 10100. P.S. It is hard to say but it is true, sign 10100, which authorities believe that the 10100 is referring to the code dead body. Sadly, this letter was not made to the public up until last year in April. 
and they probably had you know good reason for it they don't obviously release all of the information in a case because in order to catch the killer they need some information that only the killer would know but for a letter that was sent i don't know if i would keep that to myself we don't know whose name it was on there so maybe that's why all the possibilities i mean somebody could have recognized the handwriting or you know put two and two together and helped them out but police believed that keeping the letter private at the time was their best bet around the time that carla was murdered there were actually nine other cases that were going on. Brandy Marie St. Romain, a 25 year old white female who was stabbed to death. Sheila Gotcher, an 18 year old black female who was stabbed to death. June Ward, a 25 year old white female who had been strangled. Ori Lee Prescott, a 31 year old black female who had been strangled. Eleanor Stark, a 69-year-old white female who had died from blunt force trauma to the head. Lisey McGee, a 17-year-old white female who had been stabbed to death. Ruth Peters, a 76-year-old white female who had been stabbed to death. Bill Holmes, a 29-year-old white male who had died from blunt force trauma to the head, which he was the only male. Mary Rachel Trileka, 17, Lisa Renee Wilson, 14, and Julie Ann Mosley, 9, known as the Trio Girls, who had set out to go Christmas shopping at Seminary South Shopping Center in Fort Worth on December 23rd, 1974, less than one year after Carla Walker, and the girls are still missing to this day. Now, there was a detective named John Terrell that believed a man named William Ted Wilhoy was responsible for Carla, Becky, and the Trio Girls. And Wilhoy was somebody that Detective Terrell already knew. He already had put him behind bars at one point. And in 1975, he tried to cash two $500 saving bonds that were reported stolen. The man matched Will Hoyt's description when Detective Terrell and another officer arrived at Will Hoyt's residence. He was standing in his yard and said, well, I was wondering when you were going to come after me for Carla Walker. While he was at the police station, Will Hoyt wasn't really saying much, so that's when Detective Terrell, you know, started telling him things like, you're a good man, you're a good Christian man. You have to come forward if you did something. And those sort of things. And that is when, you know, Will Hoyt started to break down and cry. And he was basically saying like, yeah, he can't live with this anymore. And he was going to confess something. And just when he was going to do that, a, another federal agent had opened the door to question him about the savings bonds and that is like he just completely shut down like he was not confessing shit and unfortunately they could never get him to that point again he served time for the fraud and was later paroled in 1978 where he then relocated and was studying for the ministry at Abilene Christian University but it did not take long for him to sexually assault a woman in her own home and he was sentenced to 40 years in prison. Lil White was questioned about a girl named Janelle Kirby. Janelle is a woman who someone entered through her garage to get to her apartment, handcuffed her, tried to rape her, and then shot her five times in the face. I remember reading that her hair got caught um, in the pistol, like from them like scuffling around, and that's how she got shot. 
but she ended up living. She believed that Kenneth Leslie Miller, a 24 year old veteran, was responsible for this. And while they were in court, he ended up finding out that they're trying to put him away for 70 years. And he said, screw that. And he bolted and disappeared. A Fort Worth police sergeant, Leonard Schilling, tracked him down in Las Vegas 12 years later. Guys, 12 years he was on the run. But Leonard actually received a call later on that they believed that Will Hoyt was responsible for this crime and not Kenneth. And Will Hoyt actually ended up getting immunity and he confessed that he was responsible for this. But Janelle actually doesn't believe that Will Hoyt was responsible because when she looked at the pictures of the two side by side, she is 100% sure that Kenneth was responsible for it. Although when the police asked Will Hoyt only something that the attempted murderer would know, he answered correctly. So I don't know. Will Hoyt was later paroled in 1992, the year of my birth, but he ended up going back in 1995 for burglary, burg, burglary, 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 burg, 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 you get what I'm saying. But he was paroled again in 2003 and even though the 65 year old criminal is a registered sex offender, uh, an attempted murderer, he is now a free man and is living in Robstown, Texas. Free. What? What? Scott free. Now, I forgot to mention this, but the reason that they believed Will Hoyt was responsible for the Carla's case was because there was a witness that came forward that had said that they saw Will Hoyt at the bowling alley that night of Carla's kidnapping. He also took a polygraph test about Carla and he failed, but the reason that he failed, he had said that he was thinking of another case one that he raved that he could never be prosecuted in, which ended up being Janelle Kirby. So after 46 long, long years, Carla's case has finally been solved. 77 year old Glenn Samuel McCurley was arrested on a charge of capital murder in Carla Walker's case due to DNA testing. The DNA evidence on the clothing and bra on Carla the night she was killed was sent to a couple different private labs, which the DNA profile was used to narrow the search to three brothers with the last name McCurley. Police collected trash from McCurley's residence in July of this year, and with that, they were able to confirm that McCurley's DNA was the DNA that was found on Carla's bra. Now, McCurley was actually a suspect from the beginning because he only lived about a mile away from the bowling alley and he had actually just recently purchased a 22 Ruger, which the purchase order matched ones from a magazine found left behind at the bowling alley but McCurley had told them that the gun was stolen during a fishing trip and he never reported it because he was an ex-con and they just didn't have much else on him at the time. And he basically denied any involvement with Carla. Um, he said he didn't know her, he had no idea about her, which to me, makes me wonder because this case was such a public, huge case in the community. How do you not even, how have you not even heard of her? You don't even know who she is? I mean, everybody knew who she was. This was a very big case in this community. 
But police kind of just said okay and moved on because they didn't really have much on him other than that. I mean, they had nothing to hold up in court. I mean, you can assume, you can accuse somebody for something, but if you don't have evidence of that person actually committing the crime, then they're just going to get off scot-free because there's nothing holding them. On September 10th of this year, police returned to McCurley's home and spoke to him and his wife. McCurley told the same story that he had told detectives in 1974. He said he did not kill anyone and did not know Carla Walker. McCurley agreed to provide a DNA sample and six days later, police said they were notified that swabs matched the DNA found on Walker's bra. A warrant for capital murder was then obtained and McCurley was taken into custody in the Tarrant County Jail on a charge of capital murder with the bond set at $100,000. During a news conference in September, detectives with Fort Worth Police Department said they believe the assault and murder were random and that Carla and her killer did not know each other. McCurley lived a relatively normal life, was married, and had two children. Police also said that McCurley is not a suspect in any other crimes, but I find that hard to believe because, I mean, who just goes out and abducts a random person, you know, sexually assaults them and murders them, and then just doesn't do it again. It's just, I don't, I don't know, it's just crazy to me. I mean, I feel like there would be more cases that he was involved in, maybe Becky Martin. McCurley also said in a radio interview that he did not abduct Carla. He had been saving her from her boyfriend. He told police that he had been working the night that Carla went missing, but the police did find out that he only worked until 4.30 that night of the dance, and the following day he had off of work and his wife was out of town. He said that he was driving around, drinking very heavily, and he went to the bowling alley to park. Okay, sorry, I had to let my dog out. Um, but yeah, he was... He said that he was, he was driving around drinking heavily and that is when he went to the bowling alley and he saw that uh, Rodney was assaulting Carla and he said that he went over there to knock him out and get him off of her to help Carla. Okay. So yeah, this is when he went over there and Rodney was screaming at Carla and so McCurley opened the door to pull him off of Carla and he knocked him out and he pulled Carla to his car. He said that they had talked for a while and Carla had calmed down and he said that she was actually thankful for him to save her. He said that Carla had given him a hug and he gave her a kiss and that he had mistaken her for something else. McCurley said he didn't mean to do it. While in court, McCurley sat in a wheelchair in a red jumpsuit while his attorney, Stephen Myers, argued factors like his decades living in the same Fort Worth area and his liver cancer, meaning he is not a flight risk. I don't care. I'm gonna enter her name right here because I don't wanna butcher it, which I will if I attempt to say her last name because I don't know how to pronounce it. But Kim, an assistant district attorney for Tarrant County, 
was not having it. She argued that McCurley's bond needed to be raised higher to 500,000 instead of 100,000 due to the heinous nature of his crimes that he committed. When McCurley spoke to detectives, he said that he was as good as dead if he had told them what he did. He referenced self-harm if he was to be incarcerated on this offense. Now, McCurley outlived the statue of limitations for Rodney's assault, which I think is absolute bullshit. I'm sorry, but I don't care how long it's been. You're just now finding the guy, so why should he not be charged in assaulting Rodney as well? He did it. Police said that they did obtain a confession from McCurley during an interview. And it's actually crazy because the police thought that this was a serial killer or somebody that was you know, just passing by like a truck driver, which he was a truck driver, but he actually was a local, like he lived in the area and he remained in that area for years. I mean, all of this time, it's been 46 years and he still lives there. And it's crazy because, I mean, to everybody else, like he's just a normal person, you know, to his wife, he was a normal person to his kids he was a normal person and it's just crazy to me to think like you just never know with people just never know now Carla's family are actually better people than I am because they forgive McCurley for what he had done to you know their sister and they're praying for him and his family because, you know, his family are, are going through something too. They're losing somebody that they love. And, you know, I mean, it's not their fault. But Carla's family is also expecting the justice that she deserves. And they deserve. Jim Walker, which is Carla's brother, says the murder destroyed his mother. I mean, she was extremely depressed, which is totally understandable, um, but sadly she did pass away before getting relief of her daughter's killer. Jim had said, we are praying for you. We don't hate you. I hope that the city of Fort Worth has prayers for the family. It's not their fault. We'll see justice served with prayers and forgiveness. He wants to pray for his family. We forgive him for what he's done. I really hope that one day when I'm in heaven, I want to see Glenn there too. Which I think is amazing for Jim to find it in his heart to forgive Glenn because I, for one, could not. Um, but also, I mean, you don't ever know that situation. Um, I mean, it has been 46 long, long years. So you just can't ever judge somebody for a situation that you don't know anything about. But that is it, guys. That is Carla Jan Walker's tragic story um, on how she died. And I just feel so sorry for her. I mean, I couldn't even imagine being in that situation. Oh, and just before anybody says, oh, well, why didn't they lock the door when they were sitting there? They were actually in Rodney's mother's car and they did say that the passenger side door, the lock wasn't good and, it, and it, I don't think it locked. Um, Cause that was my question too. Like why wouldn't they think about locking the door? But I did read that it, it was like the lock was like jammed or something or it didn't lock or something was faulty with the lock. Because I'm sure if they could, you know, I'm sure all of the other doors were locked. Unfortunately, Carla's was just so happened to be open. Um, so, yeah. But yeah, let me know what you guys think in the comments. I would love to know your input. Um, and just, you know, give me some feedback.
So that is it, guys. Thank you so much for watching. If you lasted this long, I know this is a really long case. There was so much, you know, details into it. I think that's what really drew me into it because it wasn't just like, oh, you know, this happened and then this person was a suspect and then they got charged and then, you know, that was it. I mean, this was a long case that lasted 46 years. So I think that's why it like drew me into like, oh, what happened next? Like who else was a suspect? And then, you know, why were they a suspect? Or, you know, like what did this person do to be a suspect? Or, you know, whatever. So, but thank you so much for watching and I will see you in my next video. Bye.